Right, so now we're waiting until January 2019 for Kingdom Hearts 3 to come out. I can't say I'm surprised, but at least there's a more concise release date. Okay, so, uh, I've never actually played this game up until now, and it was certainly something. What we've essentially got is a spin-off game, and I know Kingdom Hearts fans cringe at that word, but honestly, you can easily skip this one and you wouldn't miss a thing. I mean, it has some bearing on the overarching plot, but not enough to warrant buying another console just to play this game. This time, it's the Nintendo DS's turn to shine, and in 2009, three years after Kingdom Hearts 2's release, came Kingdom Hearts 358 Days Over 2, a name that does make sense in context with the game's story, but is still a ridiculous title. Is this a game or a freaking math test? However, judging by the cover, it looks like we're focusing on Roxas again. He's got his own game now, instead of being brushed aside three hours in. We're shown what happened during his time with the organization and what led him to his fate by Kingdom Hearts 2. Maybe we might also get to learn more about the other organization members and get some deep character reflection. I don't know why this game had to specifically come out on the DS other than its popularity when the PS2 could do the job even better, but the HD collections do improve the resolution on the cutscenes and even add some brand new ones that were only conveyed in text and blank character models. The only expense to this is removing the entire gameplay, which means any fight scenes in the movie version abruptly end and everything Roxas does in the actual game are still told through walls of text. These splice cutscenes give you a solid three hours of story to watch, saving you the trouble of actually playing the game, but before I get ahead of myself, we should actually cover the plot. If you remember from Kingdom Hearts 2, Rox has lost all memory of who he really is, but was taken in by the organization and becomes its 13th member because unlike the others, he's able to wield the Keyblade. He gets sent on daily missions to other worlds and everyone's favorite two-colored metropolis Twilight Town, and Roxas is accompanied by various organization members that you would think have a chance to be fleshed out a little more than in Chain of Memories and Kingdom Hearts 2, but you'd be wrong! No, these guys are still cardboard cutouts with names, and after only an hour or so in, half of them are sent to Castle Oblivion to deal with Sora and kick off the events of Chain of Memories, which, as you may remember, doesn't end well for them, so any further character development is thrown right out the window. The only bit of growth we get comes from the newly formed friendship between Axel and Roxas after spending time doing missions together. Every day after they complete a mission, they always hang out at the roof of Twilight Town's clock tower and eat some sea salt ice cream. However, things get a little more interesting after a few missions when Axel gets sent to Castle Oblivion and we're introduced to a 14th organization member named Shion, who, like Roxas, is also an amnesiac, and she can use the Keyblade just like him. The similarities between Shion and Roxas create a sort of bond between the two, and eventually, when Axel comes back from Castle Oblivion, Shion becomes part of their little friendship group. The story is told in the span of 358 days over two people, being Roxas and Shion, which is where this mess of a title comes into play. Over time, Shion gradually becomes more and more bothered about who she really is and starts distancing herself from Roxas and Axel. Shion discovers that she's another replica created by the organization as Plan B in case things with Roxas didn't go as anticipated, since they're the only ones that can use the Keyblade and gather hearts from Heartless. On top of this, Shion's mere existence prevents Sora from getting his memories restored, as told by Riku after clashing blades with her for a bit. Shion's torn between staying with Roxas and Axel and merging with Sora, but instead chooses to leave the organization, with Axel finding out and trying to stop her. Roxas is kind of left in the dark for the rest of the game and slowly starts losing Axel's trust about Shion and his own purpose in life, eventually turning his back on the organization organization to search for answers about who he really is, while also looking for Shion by himself. Soon he finds her in Twilight Town as she explains that the organization altered her biological code so that she can absorb Roxas' powers and become a perfect clone of Sora, since Roxas is Sora's nobody and is why Shion looks like a black-haired Kairi. The two have to battle to the death and stop halting each other's progress, but Roxas emerges victorious and Shion begins to fade away as she requests that he stops the organization's plans before fusing with Sora and all memories of Shion die with her. Roxas heads back to the world that never was to try and defeat the organization, but Riku stops him in his tracks and tries to capture Roxas so that Sora's memory restoration process can resume. Roxas completely overpowers Riku, which causes him to retaliate by giving in to the darkness, turning him into Ansem, and finally restrain Roxas. Afterwards, he gets put into the virtual Twilight Town from Kingdom Hearts 2 with no memories of his time with Organization 13, in the hopes that one day Sora will wake up again. Yeesh, that's one downer of a plot, but it is the most interesting thing about this game, and some of the dialogue isn't too badly written either for Kingdom Hearts standards. Shion, who else will I have ice cream with? Hey, I said some of the dialogue wasn't bad. 
358 Days does assume that you know the story of the last three games, so I certainly wouldn't recommend this as your first game in the series, and unfortunately, most of the future games are going to follow suit. I'm still very indifferent to the organization as well. This could have been a great opportunity to expand their character arcs a little more, but it's utterly missed, and the Axel and Roxas friendship is the best thing to come out of it, while also making a bigger impact on the opening events of Kingdom Hearts 2. There's sort of a hinted past between Axel and Saix as well, one of the head honchos for the organization. It's not elaborated on too much, but out of the 14 members, Saix seems to be one of the few that has a story to tell. As for Shion, well, she wasn't alluded at any point in the previous game, so something was definitely bound to happen to her. She's an okay character, and it is quite depressing to see how she and Roxas live, but there were no surprises at all. Who knows, maybe Shion might come back in Kingdom Hearts 3, and she and Roxas can live happily ever after in that game, but I'm not crossing any fingers. I guess it's that time to talk about what actually goes on between the story. Alright, let's do it. At first, Kingdom Hearts 358 Days doesn't seem too different from previous games, and it's nice to see that it's possible to make a handheld Kingdom Hearts game without resorting to cards. You're still hacking and slashing and defeating Heartless like you normally do, only now to compromise for being on a handheld, you're required to tackle various bite-sized missions, similar to Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker and the Phantom Pain. As you complete the given missions, the story unravels more and more, and then you accomplish the next set of missions. This is what you do throughout the entire game, and with a repeated process like this, it can't be that long, right? Oh, oh sweet, sweet Jesus! Jesus. Yeah, this is my biggest problem with 358 Days. It is way too long for how simple this structure is, and I wouldn't mind it so much if the combat wasn't as basic as it is. It tries to be a fusion of Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, but leans more towards the first game, and yet still provides much less to do than either of the two games. Fighting Heartless is much slower than it was previously, not to mention enemies in general have way more health than they need to, and with how little is added to the combat, battling can become extremely mindless. You could argue that the other games can be like that too, but those ones at least added more moves and abilities as you leveled up. Even Chain of Memories, for as boring and repetitive as that game got, the car combinations still offered plenty of variety. The closest you'll get to Kingdom Hearts 2's style of gameplay is with the new Limit Breaks, where when your health's below a certain level, you can swing your Keyblade much faster and do more damage for a limited time. As explained before, Roxas needs to go on a number of missions to advance the plot, but not all of them involve simply destroying Heartless and building Kingdom Hearts. Occasionally, you may need to grab medals or or you might need to do some reconnaissance when you enter a new world. I could not freaking stand these ones. You do nothing but run around and examine every little spot until the game tells you you're okay to leave. Oh yeah, each time you complete a mission, you're not immediately warped back to the world that never was. No, you have to walk all the way back to the portal that leads you there. Every. Single. Time. Various organization members will also join you to either help battle Heartless, well, when the AI wants them to anyway, it's sort of inconsistent, or they'll likely just scold you if you so much as breathe incorrectly. You're doing so many of these missions for no rhyme or reason, only because Saix tells you to. They don't advance the story in any way, they don't teach you anything you don't already know, they're just pointless. Like, take this mission, for example, when Zaldan goes missing in Beast Castle. You search every nook and cranny for that dreadlock hippie and absolutely cannot find him no matter how hard you try. But then, after you examine and everything and head to the portal that brought you here, there he suddenly is. He doesn't give an explanation as to why he was gone or why he didn't inform the organization. He just says it's a shame you wasted your time and that's that. What, what was, was the, the freaking, freaking point? point? You know, at least with Peace Walker, even though some of the missions weren't all that important, you still felt like you were making progress towards your ultimate goal. Here, the missions just feel entirely random, also that the story takes longer to finish. That's great design. After about a few hours of gameplay, you've seen everything it has to offer. Hell, the first couple of hours are nothing but slow monotonous tutorial missions to get you ready for the same shit you're going to be doing for the next 20 or so hours. Supposedly, if you also go above and beyond with your tasks and fill this bar all the way, then you gain extra rewards. But as far as I know, I haven't earned anything at all, or at least nothing worthy of my extra time and effort. And 358 Days has the balls to include extra challenge missions on top of this, which are thankfully only optional, but all they are are just the same missions you do in the story with different handicaps in each one. You can exchange the medals you earn for certain items, but I am not doing those those missions again simply for that. And oh Christ, I haven't even mentioned the panel system yet. Each time you complete a mission, you may get some new panels for maybe spells or items or abilities that you can put into this grid in order to enable them. You know, sort of like how Resident Evil 4 does it with its inventory. However, simply installing one item or spell panel doesn't mean you can use them multiple times. No, you have to keep dragging more panels into the grid until you think you may have enough, and for some bizarre reason, you can only equip one accessory at a time, when I'm pretty sure Roxas has other places in his body he can wear them. But wait, 
there's more. You also can change Keyblades without installing a Keyblade panel, where you can add any buffs to your liking, so long as you have those panels to begin with. But wait, there's still more. In addition to somehow fitting Keyblade panels, ability panels, and multiple magic and item panels, you also can't level up without installing a level panel that you still have to earn by gaining enough experience. Hold the damn phone. If I got enough experience in the previous games, leveling up was a permanent upgrade. But now to even get that luxury, I have to waste space in my already cluttered inventory? What idiot thought that was a good idea? You'd also think the higher tiered spells would be more effective than the ones you start with, right? No. Take the Cure and Fire spells, for instance. The basic Cure spell restores a chunk of your health while Fire launches a homing fireball. Simple. But with the upgraded Cure spell, the health only gradually fills back up, while Fyra just casts a fireball straight ahead of you. How is that better? Who would even want that? This game does not improve as it goes on, and keeping with the theme of repetition, every world you go to has been done before in past Kingdom Hearts titles, and by this point in the series, I am so tired of them. It didn't take long for me to get sick of the music either, especially after hearing them in three other games. Twilight Town will forever make my blood boil every time I see or hear it. If you thought it was bad in Kingdom Hearts 2 for overstaying its welcome, Jesus Christ, you have not played this game. The only thing that's vaguely new is Neverland actually taking place in Neverland this time, but don't get too excited. It's just one giant empty space to fly around in. Honestly, I'm not even sure why they bothered adding Disney Worlds. I don't think they've ever been as redundant in any Kingdom Hearts game as they are here. Roxas and the organization don't interact with the characters in any way, and the only Disney villain you find in the whole game is Pete, making their inclusion all the more pointless and the least amount of care put into them. Final Fantasy cameos have also been cut entirely, with the exception of the organization Moogle that has an adorable little hood, and once again acts as the game's shop where you buy and sell panels, as well as synthesizing different equipment if you have the materials for it. Most of these worlds never stick around for more than a few missions because of how often you bounce around between them. You would think that maybe the game would just let you complete all the missions for that world and then you move on to the next one, but instead you'll often get more missions pop up for the previous worlds later down the road and it keeps on going. So some of these missions were beyond annoying. I freaking hated the battle with Leech Gray for how much he hurts even after installing all of my level panels, and the Ruler of the Sky took far too much time to kill because he wouldn't stop moving. These missions aren't fun, they're busy work, but if for whatever reason you get a kick out of them, you can also choose to play them again in mission mode, which lets you control all the organization members and eventually Donald and Goofy. Admittedly, it is kind of cool to play as these guys for the first time, and I imagine the co-op multiplayer was a neat bonus back then, but good luck finding anyone to play with you nowadays, and asking you to play the same unaltered missions again after finishing the story is frankly tiring. I already wasn't invested at all with the game and so many times that I just want to put it down and call it a day. I was that bored. Making me do the same tedious missions over and over again was taking the piss and I swear that the running time felt way longer than 22 hours. I'm really not sure which is the worst game between 358 Days or Chain of Memories, but I guess if I had to choose, I would probably pick 358 Days. I can say that with confidence now too because I recently played and finished Recoded for the first time, which was the last game on my list before completing them all. Graphically, 358 Days is an okay looking DS game. Not amazing, but not horrible either. Though something's very wrong with Aladdin's and Captain Hook's character models. It's mostly the eyes. I don't know what the hell happened with these two, and I don't think I want to know. There's no point in playing 358 at this day and age. It's not worth the struggle or your patience, and you're way better off just watching the movie. The story is the only intriguing thing about it, and I think Square knew that. I kind of wish I had a little more to say about this game to make up for the wasted time, but that's how repetitive and dull it is. 358 Days is definitely one of the low points in the series, but thankfully the next game is a rather favorited one amongst a number of fans. After a couple of individual videos, we'll be looking at Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep for the PSP. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a good day.